So uh, I'm uh, Christian Lutzenitz. I'm uh, the senior lecturer in Tibetan and Buddhist arts. So I'm probably the one in this room who knows least about Southeast Asia. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, it's an interesting topic. I think that is relevant far beyond uh, the region anyway. Uh, so I'm learning a lot. Uh, we had a very interesting session in the morning uh, with a good discussion and uh, we'll hope to continue that uh, now with uh, the first <laughs> presentation by uh, Dr. Leslie Pullen, who is an independent researcher and uh, did her PhD head to us uh, in, finished in 2017. I was surprised that it's such a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, which is now uh, published as a monograph pattern, uh, patent uh, splendor, published in April uh, 2021. Uh, and yeah, obviously she has uh, organized and initiated this workshop uh, for which we are very grateful and put a lot of work into it uh, with this even more work than it would usually be with this kind of two year uh, delay. So she will present on one of the most interesting objects that she worked on for her PhD there uh, and present as an object biography of Arabatana Manjushri from Java to Russia. Please. Thank, thank you, Christian, very much. <clears throat> okay, everybody, you'll now finally get to know about the sculpture that faces us on the wall and on your program. So why this Manjushri? Let me just see if this is going to go. No. Same thing, isn't it? Oh, yeah, there we go. Why this Manjushri? Well, I first came across the drawing, and you're going to see the drawing on the left here a number of times during my PhD research, as Krishna said, here at SOAS, along with the relevant information on him in volume two of Chandi Singh Asari and Panacharan, both books as part of JLL Brandes' two volumes on Jago and Singasari. A statue was found at the site of Chandi Jogo, but was only written up in volume two, <clears throat> which gave me a lot of confusions for a long time because I had to work out how to translate the old Dutch using Google Translate, I have to say, yet again. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to present you a brief outline of the first appearance of Manjushri in Java with some examples, not this one, but others of both um, statues in stone and bronze. And I will follow by the resurgence of the parlor art style in East Java with a form of Arapachana. And then I'll chart the journey of the statue in the early 1800s from East Java to 1945 in Russia and its eventual return to storage in Russia in 2016. So, Chandi Sewu, the Bodhisattva Manjushri is known as the knowledge being Manjushri and his name means gentle glory in Sanskrit. His earliest appearance is in the form of Kumara or Royal Prince at the 8th century Mahayana Buddhist Chandisewu, known as the Manju Grisha or House of Manjushri. The cult of this Bodhisattva traveled to Jara, resulting in the construction of one or more temples dedicated to the deity. And it's been suggested that perhaps the Selendra rulers saw him as a powerful deity to protect their royal status and their people. An old Malay inscription, which is at the top there, very little example, dated 792, found in the southwest corner of the Chandisewa yard, it announced the construction and the enlargement of a grand prasada or monument. Every graphic and architectural vestiges suggest that Manjushri was a prominent bodhisattva revered by the 8th century, 8th century Silendra rulers. John Mixik, who all of you know of, has indicated that the context in which Manjushri was installed in Indonesia had significant religious and political associations. So these two statues from Chandi Plausen on the right in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, which I'm sure William will talk more about, are one of a pair. And below, the Manjushri remains at Chandi Plausen in a cellar on the south side. At this early date in central Java, Manjushri appears as Kumara, as we see here, depicted with triangular projections or wings behind his head, which I've circled, and are evident on either side of the back slab. The statues all appear adorned with the Chanavira or the cross chains, and the Prajaparamita Sutra on the Utpala or Blue Lotus on the upper left side of the body. 
Evidence of the popularity of Manjushra within the Buddhist pantheon is known by as many as 41 sadhanas dedicated to him, where he is generally acknowledged as the first bodhisattva to appear in Buddhist literature. From the extant stone statues and the small metal icons, it is perhaps significant to note the importance of the central Javanese ruler gave to Manjushri, as there appear to be numerous examples in most of these manifestations. For example, evidence of the three hair curls characterizes Manjushri, if we see in the middle one, um, the middle picture at the top, along with his distinctive attribute, the water lily. In the purest form, Manjushri appears holding the sword placed on the Lilot Pala, which is Abai circled in the top there, as we see in the image in the center. A bronze Kumara from the British Museum in the Botta Centra appears with the triangular protections behind his head, unique to the central Javanese images. And this is important to remember when you look at the, the later example. Mixic has written a lot more of this, but we have no time to discuss it in this lecture. Um, as does the Rijksmuseum icon next to him, both dressed in a distinctive Javanese style. On the left here, the renowned silver Kumara Buddha at the National Museum is seated in Lali Asana with the right hand open in Virada Mudra. The palm tattooed with the image of the Visvadra, a symbol of two cross Vajras. And this again is the only um, sculpture that I found in all my research that has a Visvadra carved on the hand. The notable resurgence of uh, sorry, go on to the next one. I will introduce now the Arapachana example of Manjushri. On the left, we see a sample from the late Pala period. And this stone statue from Malta remains in the Dhaka Museum. The central figure, accompanied by four jinnas instead of the four companions, as we see on the right, which is the Hermitage Arapachana. On the right, the East Java Manjushri dates from the late 13th century and shows an apparent similarity in form and iconography to the Malda Arapachana, which is dated to the late 12th century. This notable resurgence of Manjushri Arapachana at Chandi Jago highlights the autonomy and innovation of Java at least 100 years after such a Buddhist cult subsided in East India. Mix also has suggested that the statues and shrines of this size and quality were almost certainly sponsored directly by the most politically influential members of society, the kings or relatives. The Hermitage Arapachana's face appears in, in deep meditation and depicts an assured realism, realism of both human features and perhaps divine imperfection compared to the Indian version on the left. We're now going to see four depictions of Manjushri, um, the Arapachana figure. This is him now seated on the lotus throne in princely ornaments and adored with a kind carved in a unique textile pattern, an aspect that was not noted by any other scholars. And this was really the central focus of my PhD and my book. His attributes are the sword of knowledge that he holds a loft, a loft in his right hand and has a damaged palm leaf manuscript in the left and at, in his chest. His chest is broad and his belly appears sucked in, which might suggest he is in Yogya Pragnana. This feature is clearly apparent in many central Javanese bronze figures, but is not apparent in the equivalent Indian statues. This aspect may reflect an earlier post to late Pala period of art styles. So on the left, this is the famous drawing or what has been the drawing that's plagued me for the last 15, 10 years, sorry. And this drawing was by J. T. H. Bick made in the first decade of the 19th century. Raffles commissioned the drawing between 1807 and 1815, and I'll talk about more about this a little bit later. In the photograph um, was a picture produced in, by Kumaraswamy in 1916. It's very important in this paper that you note the dates because there's a real jumping around, so you have to keep your head around the dates that I mentioned. So he referenced the photo's provenance at the Museum for Volkenkund in Berlin and where it was on public view. And again, more on that a little later. And then the only other drawing we have is this very dodgy, very poor drawing that appears, um, was collected by Raffles in the field during his tenure as governor. There's no similarity to the actual Manjushri. So the Manjushri Arapachana statue originated from Chandi Jago complex, which is just outside Malang in East Java, where um, Echo is seated right now. King Krajanagara, who was the last Singhasari king during the East Java period, built Jago in 1286 in memory of his father, 
and Krishnagara died in 1292. So this was the really, apart from Chani Singh, sorry, it was never finished. This was his, the biggest monument. However, the Jago Chandi is not precisely where Manjushri originated, as it's likely that he would have had his own pavilion. Stanford Raffles in the early 19th century and Lutzing Schola in the 21st century both suggested that Manjushri must have had a separate shrine or platform to himself. The notion he was created in a separate chandi and a different style is reflected in the relief carvings that we see on the top here that appear around the lower terraces and the statue of Moka Pasha that remains in the site and the four statues of his attendants, which are in the National Museum in Indonesia, whose stylistic compared to the Manchusri is really quite different. As Islam fought Buddhism to retreat in Northeast India around the 12th to 13th centuries, the Buddhist monks moved with their texts to settle and study in different regions of Nepal, Tibet, Burma, Cambodia, and to Java. Now inscriptions have always played a critical data source and can be utilized along stylistic interpretation. This statue of Manjushri should be dated about 1268 at the time of the Shraddha ceremony for Chandi Jago. However, the inscription dates to 1265 Saka and it reads, quote, the Supreme King of Arya lineage erected this statue of Manjushri according to the rules in the year 5621. Oh, it's going all by itself. <laughs> Magic these things, right? Don't touch it. Um, to foster the Dharma, i.e. the law and true faith in the Buddhist sense in the Buddha temple. The inscription states it was Prince Aditi Varman who built in the city of the Buddha temple, i.e. Jago, an amazingly beautiful temple to guide his parents and king from this sublunar existence to the joys of Nirvana. Therefore, this text would indicate that there was a separate temple built for the Manjushri statue in the Jago complex, where he is dedicated or shall we say consecrated as the statue of Bhairava, but appears here in the form of Manjushri. And I've been told that maybe these earliest um, uh, in, uh, sorry, translation of the inscriptions may not be correct. Um, there's definitely more work to be done on this statue, which is something life back to normal I can now do. Obviously, it doesn't like me. I want to draw your attention to some facts from the early years of the 19th century. Colin Connell McKenzie, who we've heard of a few times now, who worked with Governor Raffles between 1811 and 16. He donated his vast collection of archaeological information, manuscripts and drawings to the library of his employer, the East India Company. However, it should also be remembered that this vast amount of archaeological observations relied heavily on the work of Nicholas Engelhardt during his period as governor of the north coast of Java. At this time, any references or photos of the Manjushri are rare. As we see, the big drawing, again in the centre, was published only 100 years later in 1909 Brandis's two volumes. A photo of Manjushri was then again published in Olga Deshpande's Hermitage Exhibition Catalogue in 2016, followed by my recent book, Pattern Splendor, in 2021. And now there he is in 2022 as the headline for this symposium. However, in 2003, uh, Kinney wrote Worshipping Shiva and Buddha. She describes Manjushri as a plaster cast and that he disappeared from Berlin, but believed to be in St. Petersburg, but then full stop, had no idea what happened after that. So now I'll start the story of what happened to this statue. In 1802, Nicholas Engelhard, who you know who he is now, with the governor general from 01 to 08 of the north coast of Java, he traveled to Chandi Jago and removed the Manjushri. Then in 1803, he removed six more statues from Singasari and placed them in his garden for his pleasure, as it were. Between years 1801 and 08, Engelhardt, then under Raffles, commissioned the drawing. And it's all about the drawing. This is really the key crux to this statue is everything came from this drawing. The drawing was made to the scale of two thirds the size of the statue. And according to Rufa, writing in Brandes um, in the 1909 Singasari book, that the drawing was made on paper thin Chinese paper, rather like tissue paper, roughly on or for about 1808. And as there was no paper like this made in, in Holland, he had to have done the drawing in the nether, in the Batavia before the sculpture left. Unfortunately, Bick's drawing has never appeared in Raffles' History of Java, where it should have been, 
but it's only published 100 years later in Brandis's book, as we see um, in the top right. In 1823, the sculpture was taken to Batavia from Samarang, along with many others, and then shipped to the Netherlands in 1827. By 1828, Manjushri, with two others, were taken to Zulladen to his sister's garden in Groningen, where they remained in the garden as ornaments, I guess, too heavy to go inside. So, man, I guess it doesn't like me this one. Upon the death of Engelhaar's sister, the statue with the mediation from the Japanese magazine, along with her heirs, sold the Manjushri to auctioneer's great royal bazaar of De Boer and Sons in the Hague in the 1850s. We see here in the photo that the decoration on the building are in the honor of Queen Willem and Prince Hedrick in 1901. And the building um, is the only photograph I find of it, 1946, it probably doesn't look like that now. The statue was then sold to Conrad Lehmans, director of the Museum for Antiquities in Leiden. In Batavia in 1857, in Batavia, we're back now in Java, uh, Dr. Friedrich became acquainted with a collection of drawings of Javanese antiquities collected by Engelhard and by, began translating the two Kawi square script instructions on the front and the reverse of the stone, as you saw in an earlier slide. He wondered at the time if the inscription was the same as that on the stone raffles presented to Lord Minto that we've just heard about. In March 1861, Friedrich showed Lehmanns, the director of the Berlin Museum for Antiquities, the drawings of the statue and the two inscriptions, which Lehmanns then recognized as the statue which was in the garden of the Grand Bazaar, which we saw, I uh, talked about a little earlier. By this time, the drawing, the drawing, not the statue, was in Leiden, numbered 123. But in July 1861, the statue was then sold to the Museum von Funkenkund in Berlin, numbered IC 1065. Then in 1864, they finally put it on display in room 27. And I've been told this by the German Museum in the middle of Bay 7. And that's it, no more information, no photovirus available. So Lehmanns obtained the drawing number 123 from Leiden, which he showed to Friedrich, who then published in 1864, quote, two inscriptions on a picture of Manjushri now in the new museum in Berlin and it went into the German Oriental Society, Leipzig. I could find nothing, but I need my German colleagues to help me with that one. According to the Rufa article in Brandis volume two, the Berlin Museum was very remiss, inadequately documenting the drawing in the inventory and describing the museum's complete mismanagement. A bit harsh, I thought. As a result, in 1909, when the Brandis book was published, there was very little evidence regarding the drawing. I could find almost nothing on it 100 years later. So before we go on to the next stage of Manjushri's life, he actually lives on today. In the Indus room in the Norden Palace in The Hague, there is a copy of his statue. Between 1900 and 1911, when Brandis books on Chandi Jago and Singhasari were finished and published, the Indus room was developed as a gift for Queen Willem. The rooms, uh, Wilhelmina, sorry, the room's ornament represent the Indies and its subjects' best features. Placed within the chamber were some replicas of Hindu Buddhist sculptures carved in stone, including Prajaparamita and in bronze such as Nariti, originally from Prambanan. Queen Wilhelmina wanted the Indian hall to become known widely as possible, so photographs were taken and they appeared in the Eigenhag magazine and the Bintang India in India. L.J.C. Van S., who was the architect of the Indus Room, stated that the Manjushri statue, which was in Berlin at the time, was of the highest quality and appropriate for the room. So what to do? Initially, the plan was to copy four large statues for the Indu Hall to be carved in wood, copied from the original stone. The Javanese carver, if you see with the picture at the top here, named B.R. Eco, who was originally a cutter of Wayang figures, and you all know they are about this size, was one of the few Javanese who had some experience with figurative sculpture in wood, although not in such a large format. So Eco had barely started on the wooden statues when the wood split and tore. So he suggested that the two statues were to be made of stone and the other two statues to be cast in bronze. So volcanic stone was chosen for the Manjushi called tracheandesite, as it apparently had excellent grain and was light in color. So that's a close up of him on his platform. So photographs were taken of the pasta cars were made and sent to Batavia, 
and Craftsman Eco then set to work to create the replica. The statue is then shipped back to adorn a niche in the Indus room, where he's placed on a high wooden platform under a stone um, canopy, uh, on a stone base, sorry, between a canopy of Carla and Nakara. It is unclear from the photographs I see whether Eco managed to reconstruct the complex textile patterns accurately, as we see in the detail of the drawing below. So we return to the movement of Manjushri. In this slide, we sum of the three flak tiles, or known as flak turn, built by the Nazis used to shoot down the Allied airplanes during World War II. Manjushri, along with many hundreds of other objects, were packed up and moved in 1941 for security reasons to Berlin's Flakturn Zoo. A flak tile built near the zoo and used as a safe and secure godan as a bunker for art objects. Um, this is not the actual Flakturn Zoo. This one is just an example of what the bunker might have looked like. When the Soviets stepped into Berlin in 1945, they discovered the giant flak tiles filled with collections of Berlin's museums and galleries. And the Soviets emptied the towers within weeks. Units of the Red Army Trophy Commission or Brigade had collected on some 2 million art objects, many of which were destroyed or stolen by Soviet soldiers. However, most were on their way to Moscow and put on trucks to head east shortly after World War II, after which any information about these statues appears to be unknown. Manjushri and Harry Hara Ardenari, acquired by the State Hermitage Museum Leningrad, are now considered Russian possessions after the resolution of 1995 by the State Duma, the Russian Federation under Boris Yeltsin. In 2002, Berlin published a book of all their lost sculptures, the Documentation de Verlust Burn 3, as we see in the middle here. That's the page of it and the front cover. Where both statues we see appears on page 93, number 1065, referred to as the lost art relocated from Berlin. Evidence of the Manjushri was written about in 2008 by Lucing Skurla, who wrote a Javanese statue in the Trophy Museum, where she describes the Manjushri in great detail, includes all the past book references, but state its origin was unknown. And then again in 2012, Mojam Hujdink wrote Exhibiting the Past, and she follows the lives of many antiquities, but states also has no idea where this statue exists. So followed by Russia in 2016, when Manjushri went on display in a special exhibition, Sacred Gift of a Deity, for three months only, with several other sculptures from Java, however, most of the statues were from Thailand. This was the first time in possibly 70 years that these sculptures have been seen. So to conclude, Manjushri now languishes in storage, probably in the basement or some off, of off-site storage of the hermitage with little or no chance of being returned to Berlin or ever returning to Java. So to the best of my knowledge, at no point has Indonesia ever called for the restitution of this Manjushri. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, we have about a few minutes for questions, uh, if there are any. Uh, Please, Heidi. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Um, really interesting biography of an object, of a sacred object. I wonder if you could go back to the slide in the Indian room. Sorry, Angelica. Um, there was just, uh, I have a question, and it's about the life of a sacred again. object. Keep going. This one or the other one? This one? There was one more. Go back. No, there's only two um, slides on go, this. Go forward. There was a close up. Yes, the, go click again. There you go. One more. One more. There. There. That picture there on the lower left is that in the room? When um, the um, the curator gave me the photographs, they sent me these photographs. Okay, so the small little figure there on the right of that picture. That's yes. the relief. That's part of the relief, is it? The actual Manjushri was not made exactly the same as the Manjushri. If you look at the drawing, these figures aren't quite correct. Here. So this is the andesite version? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so there's a little figure. Okay, I'm just curious because in my journeys around uh, Myanmar temples, um, small Buddha images are often placed next to powerful large yes. ones to be kind of energized by the large powerful one. I was just curious to know whether in the context of this room, whether 
you know, there had been any kind of ritual, some sort of ritual significance given to this 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 image or, you know, any kind of... Um... In everything that I've been given and read about when he was put up here, that there wasn't any at all. But who knows? Maybe there was. I haven't been given any. But the Manjushri has four copies of him all the way around it. The original image has that. If you look at this sculpture up on the wall, there are four yeah, replicas. May, may I follow up on that? Because okay. I find that extremely interesting that there are five Manjushris actually on this uh, stele. Uh, and has anybody written about that or suggested a pro why? No, because they're so different to the Indian ones. Of course, they're not the same at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting because it reminds me of the... Uh, and I think the inscription has to be looked at and maybe compared with the Manjushri Namazagiti, because that's a likely source for the repetition. Because the inscription doesn't appear to have any relevance to the Manjushris around it. And I've been told, I mean, we need to look at the inscription again. I think we need to look again. Yes. I yeah, wouldn't be definitely. surprised if there is a, a Namazagiti relationship. It's a text that kind of uh, elevates Manjushri in a superior position encompassing all the five Buddhas. Right. And the composition indicates that you have, that each of them stands for one Buddha family. I need to do so another paper on Manchu Street. So. Yeah. So, so then there's this related question about every time a replica is made, it's not just a replica, it's a recreation again in the eyes of that, that artist. And just yeah. like that stone that we saw this morning, the Sangaran stone used in a way, the replica used in a way like a, a Sima stone, for ritual use, uh, you know, that's the same sort of yes. thing going on there. I mean, it would have been lovely to have known whether there was ritual here, but as far as I've been told, there, there was no ritual given at this time. I don't know, William, whether you know anything more about it. Nick, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. That was really fascinating. Um, uh, similar, I, I hope I didn't miss anything, but I, I just wanted to check. There's um, um, a major and long established cast plaster cast making workshop in Berlin, um, which was formed, I think, even in the 18th century. It goes back a long way. Do you, know, do you know if there was any discussion about simply making a plaster cast of the object when it was in I will talk to um, um, Maylin. As far as I know, from everything I've read, no. Okay. The plaster casts are with, uh, in, in Leiden, and, 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 and um, Jakarta, of course, this one sits there in the hallway. But I don't think so. Unlike the pressure parameter in the store, where there's zillions of them, they're all lined up, there's so many of them. So no, as far as I know, no. Okay. That's what makes it so special, because there are lots of other images of it around, I think. Yeah. One last question, please. Yeah. about the role of Lehmanns in uh, transferring the statue to Berlin, because in your PowerPoint, you say that he was the director of Berlin, but he was the di director of Leiden. And um, uh, there is a story, and maybe you know more, more, more about it, that Lehmanns didn't do enough to secure this statue for Leiden, because it was gone to Berlin before he knew it, actually. You, you have anything on that? Um, I'm hoping all of you <laughs> are going to tell me more. I found it very difficult. There was that timeline. So I said, keep your head around the dates. There seemed to be a very tight timeline and there were a lot of names. And I used the work of, of all you Dutch and German scholars to get my information from this. Okay. So I've not been able to go into the archives and I know Mylin well, tells me I need to yeah. come back to Berlin, but you know, I've restricted for the last two years to do anything much, so. Yeah, okay. Well, There's more to do. Let's talk about that also further. Yes. Yeah. So, sorry, I think okay. we are out of time now. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Well, gonna... If it's very short. No, I just wanted to say that this is really a, a crucial sensitive issue for the Berlin Museum. So um, I think it would be very helpful to use the archive sources first and also i still remember when uh, chancellor merkel was in uh, st petersburg leningrad they were also talking about these looted objects from our museum from the ethnological museum so i think uh, this is a sensitive issue a political issue we also have a comment here with regard to the name uh, by Martina Stoye. Uh, the, 
uh, 1690s, there might have been a confusion with... <laughs> now where is it? I, I need to get yeah. back to her on that. I can't really see it now. Yeah. It, hmm? yeah. But, but it, there is still one in Berlin, then a pasta cost. Can you make it smaller again? I only I only see the window, <laughs> the reflection. The Museum for Völkerkunde was founded only in 1873. The Berlin Museum of the 1960s was another institution. Yeah. So so there is a, a, a smaller issue here as well. Yeah, the, the Plastikast workshop in Berlin still owns a copy of the Manche Schrie. Okay. okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Claudine, altogether, there are five Manche Schrie on each image from Taka, from Charva, Arubachana. Okay. Yep. Good. Lots to know. Thanks very much. Everybody. Thank you very much. Yeah. The uh, sec second speaker is uh, Mylin Chuabonat. Uh, she is assistant director of the Ethnologisches Museum, Museum für Asiatische Kunst in Berlin. And uh, her PhD focused on urban planning and shop house architecture in Penang, Malaysia. And her main uh, field research or fields of interest are urban conservation, settlement history, archaeology and material culture of uh, Southeast Asia. And she will talk to us about afterlives of Hindu Buddhist gods from Java, 7th to 16th century, knowledge engagements. OK, changing my title, as you can see, I not only will talk about Java, but also my field research on Sumatra. So my uh, focus, the starting thesis is um, that uh, these are the regions I will show you, East Java and also from Sumatra, is that archaeologist Reinecke assumes that today we have access to less than 5% of all uncovered prehistoric gold objects from Southeast Asia. This is a biased, why does it? viewpoint on the scanty amount retrieved from controlled archaeological investigations in contrast to potentially large data entailed from unprovenanced research, looted sites or lost artifacts. Locational information given by stratified contexts allow the dating and gives essential is insights, but also the material represented in private acquisitions and collection in museum um, are very important and form part of the knowledge production. So therefore, my focus is two twofold. I present new provenance research on the material from the Ethnological Museum in Berlin, uh, presenting four collectors from the late 19th century and early 20th century. And the second focus is the field research I've done and observing current digging out of archaeological finds on East Java and the Musi River in Sumatra. So the materiality of gold objects is especially uh, deemed for reappropriation so that the entanglement between materiality and attributed, why doesn't it work? Value, because the physical and tactile. So this is, uh, for instance, a piece which uh, Diver gave me or a picture um, of the last diving day. So again, also the material is congested. congested and uh, as uh, Horst Liebner said, 20% of the gold finds disappeared by divers on the excavation site. So the materiality, what I wanted to show you is especially important because uh, most of the gold provenance uh, is unprovenanced, as we can see here, um, are publications from gold collections. And you have to have in mind that the physical and tactile pro properties 
is that gold is never thrown away. And uh, therefore it is always, it always has been recycled, melted and reshaped. Until today, the authentication of gold by scientific methods, as you can see here, compare the pieces, um, uh, they are the same. <laughs> Um, are the, the archometric, archometric, no, 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 back please. Okay, are, okay, as you can see here, these objects are the same, but published in different ways. So the archaeometric analysis, I've published on that, so just a short uh, remark on this. You can know the chemical content, the composition, but you can never uh, know the dating without art historical stylistic analysis and connoisseurship. So that's why it gives you this big question on the authenticity, or you find these over restored sword. It is C14 dated, but in the publication, you give this broad dating range between the 7th and the 15th, 16th century, what doesn't help at all, but we can date it precisely and it is published in a private, uh, it, we are by a private collection. So you see this material is difficult uh, to be accessed in the case of the question of authentication. Here, another example that uh, something is dated also from a private collection due to the script. The same with this one. And we have the huge collection in the museums. And I've um, listed the Hindu Buddhist uh, gold from Indonesia in museums, and most of them remain un uh, yeah, acquired post 1970s. So that's why the big question is, what is the message of these objects in the museum? I show some collections which we know from uh, Europe, a treasure-like uh, sort of uh, accumulation, the national pride of uh, yeah, maybe Kalimantan gold, maybe Javanese gold in Singapore in 2019. So again, the question, what is the message? What do you want to talk about the afterlives? So there is this scholarly bias about the gold. Some who are talking about, uh, who are not talking and reporting on illicitly excavated or traded activities in the scholarly discussions and others who do so and who want to document the material as fully as possible in order to balance historic information, which would not exist otherwise. So for instance, the German Archaeological Institute takes a restrictive opinion that unprovenanced material can't be shown in their publications. And um, of course, this also increases unprovenanced material, increases our knowledge, but it also increases the monetary value of the material itself and the credibility is doubted, as you have mentioned. Provenance research demands, and this is why I show you this image, because after five years investigations, I um, found out that the Ethnological Museum uh, hosts and has uh, Hindu Buddhist gold in their collections. So, the problem is really the, the provenance research, um, which demands excellent infrastructural resources, plentiful stuff, a staying power for maintenance and updating the registration methods. So I was facing a lot of difficulties also to study and document the material, um, as you can imagine, and the Berlin Museum in the, this section has never had an inventory of their objects. So the full number of the, the objects in the South, Southeast Asian collection is rather obscure. Um, maybe uh, 20, more than 20,000, maybe 50,000 objects, and 50% uh, or even less is digitized. You can imagine that I was really facing a lot of yeah, difficulties with the documentation and the archive word as work, as we have also seen before. So that's why coming to uh, this collector, 
Um, he offered in 8071 72 items, mainly antiquities from the, as he said, Buddha and Hindu time. And the director, Adolf Bastian, emphatically endorsed the acquisition of these antiquities quoted and relics of old Java. And uh, going with your research is that this India-centered view was um, supported by Sanskrit-oriented philologists, officials, and others who fueled the idea of a spiritual greater India and moral geography in the knowledge production. So um, that's why these um, rings uh, were also um, yeah, accepted by the as donation in 8081. He donated these rarities um, from Java to the museum, intended to serve scientific interests and complete the museum collection. Among them, these, as he calls them, Buddha rings with inscriptions. Inscriptions? They are not inscriptions, but it's the three design, as you can see here on the left hand side, the three letters. And he says they were dug up from an old well. So the museum director is uncritical about the fact that the antiquities derived from uncontrolled excavation or looting sites probably, hence feature chance finds. So they really lack insufficient locational information and only provide these circumstantial historic information, but at least this information we get. And the Diluxman, the collector writes, suggests a dating to the eighth century due to Arabic script. Actually, we would expect Sanskrit, but okay, he says Arabic. And then um, going further on, presenting these are um, three, the two ones which are probably due to their style, old ones. And the third one also uh, sort of taking up this three design might be of recent times or even a fake. Because already in 1882, doubts were raised that a fake bronze statues were part of Diduxman's donation to Albert von Sachsen, so the Dresden Museum. And um, also this might be an intentional fake or at least a newly found object of his time. So uh, another two collectors are here. And the source criticism on the source box um, first reveal that on the right hand side, this ring was not uh, is not originating from Java and it's also not gold. It could be from anywhere in Southeast Asia from any time. Also John Michik has um, stated this, supported this. So it's plated. Gold. Um, this ring is very special, translated uh, to Maha or the, the Great, so one of the very um, few signet uh, rings, seal rings, so uh, in negative. And it is from the collector A.T. Merton, who, and this is also special, the sources tell us that, and this is totally ignored in the inventory books that it is a ring from a sultan in Lombok. So we don't know why and when it was transferred. Was it due to the Lombok uh, yeah, um, um, war there that after 1894, it was sort of transferred? When was it transferred from Java to Lombok? We really don't know, but um, it is um, also due to the reading in the archive that we know more about the provenance, at least a little bit more information we get. The collector who I, uh, yeah, I, I wrote about already is uh, Konrad Ernst Prilwitz, who was staying in Malang in East uh, Java. He was a feverish collector and in 1903, 
um, he probably had more than 1000 objects and 140 objects were given to the Berlin Museum. And again, 10 years later, he also gave uh, donations to the museum. So um, he, he's very um, keen in, in addressing the acquisition circumstances. And so we also know that um, he bought, obtained artifacts from war booty from soldiers installed by the Dutch shortly after the invasion of the Gaio region. And he also um, got objects, as you can see here, the gold objects, which are shown here. But he also had many other sculptures. So the, the, the museum's intention to obtain these um, objects were first institutional competition against the Dutch museums. So um, it, they had an advisor who had uh, yeah, also given a provision to sort of um, yeah, give his expertise. So kind of um, dubious figure. And he went to the Dutch museums and said how run down these Dutch museums are. You can imagine his rhetorics. And also they were, they feared that um, Prilwitz will open up a museum by himself or give it to other museums. He was in touch with other museums. So the second reason for the Berlin Museum to get these, um, also the sculptures, was the push of the archaeological interest in those days. Third, that uh, the museum knew that exporting antiquities from Java was illegal since 1840. And the privates also said, don't please don't mention my name, never, because it's really illegal, prohibited to collect it and also to uh, export it to other countries. So the restriction was known by the museum and it could be evaded by acquiring this private collection when it was already based in Germany. So this was only possible and I will show you some of my research on his rings that we find out more goldfish uh, techniques. Um, about his rings that we can also um, have iconographic um, references of this wonderful earplug um, here in London. But this is now my uh, second part that um, I also want to show you the local debates. And for me, the turning point was the auction in 2005 when uh, statues of gold and silver were auctioned off and the uh, talk uh, and the discussion was if uh, the state should uh, claim them back, if they are real or um, sh can be sold. So um, also other debates about uh, looting uh, gold in the Sonobodoyo Museum and others are in the press. So therefore, um, I went to um, the areas where looting um, was performed, for instance, in Lamongan and Podonegor in East Java. And I have to say that this was only made possible due to networks I had with uh, private collectors in Jakarta who um, yeah, gave me the, the names of the dealers, accompanied me to the sites. Otherwise, yeah, other looters really face um, terrifying and, and really difficulty to, yeah, to visit these sites. So um, this 61-year-old uh, digger um, was um, extensively looting the area between 1960s and 2010. He hunted for every saleable artifacts. And I went to the sites um, to date them, and these were grave sites and also washed out riverbeds or um, religious um, sites as well. So um, other tre treasure hunting um, is uh, performed in two, since 2000. Uh, 11 illicit treasure hunting started um, at the site of the Sivijaya kingdom. So um, the especially divers of the island of Kemaro 
they they really understand they call themselves the children of the river and um, allegedly called their traditionally driving claim that they are this is their they are the rightful hires of the site and justify their right on the river's treasure because they are the Malay constitute a common identity. So what they prove is really a uh, yeah, technological knowledge on the tides, on the, on the diving sites. And also they re have refurbished their fishing boats, um, also looking for gold. So they use mercury, uh, washing out the gold, and they are looking for sellable objects, have their diving equipment, apnoa breathing, types going down until 30 meters for 30 minutes, one hour. So really um, the divers put at a high risk using their eye compressors and stick to a hose, a very normal mask. So this is um, the area there, the gold jewelry uh, from Palembang really yeah, gives us totally new insights on the gold finds so that not everything is from Java, but also their very early um, artifacts, styles, motifs are found in this area. So um, you can see that the prices, uh, yeah, is four times going up from the diving site there. This uh, Buddha, for instance, is sold immediately uh, to Thailand out of the country, probably via Singapore or Hong Kong. These are the spots. So sellers are now prioritizing highly priced and small size antiquities that are both easier to ship and easier to loot when what makes gold items predestined for this market segment. So in another way, I was also um, sort of um, analyzing the interactions just to give you some um, very short insights what I did about this uh, rich market there and on site. Yeah, my time is going out and also what they show when they want to sell these items um, by, hand, by mobile phones. So this is actually uh, at the end what I will show you that there was a lot of critique about this uh, show um, seen in the Mannheim Museum, and I was uh, and the, the set in the background of my discussion about the looting, illicit trade, claims of restitution, and collectors' narratives. It is really crucial that this museum refuses to take responsibility to raise awareness of contested cultural property issues and authenticity research of antique gold. Because what you can read here, um, uh, translated from German, is that um, they took the gold works just as art in its own. In their eyes, the absence of claims of return raised against the lenders uh, foundation and publications served on the collection are and enough arguments for the uh, exhibits authenticity thanks a lot thanks a lot that brings a, an, another component, that of, of, I think, forgeries and trade into the discussion. Uh, any questions? You, you did a wonderful job in getting hold of the looters. Uh, what, what, was that, was that, yeah, was that easy? I can't imagine that was easy. It, it was easy because I had the context of um, influential collectors, but without them, I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare actually. But it, it is, yeah, you you can go there and get some context, but it's also, it might be dangerous uh, that they don't really <laughs> let you in. And there are competing um, groups. So each morning in, in Palembang, uh, they are coming to the site and who's faster, who, who got better uh, contacts, then they, it's, it's just sold and gone. Please. 
Yes, to go on on that point, because I, I think it's very interesting what you did that work with, uh, with the looters and the people of the boat, uh, the people of the river, the Musi. Um, you said at a certain point that they feel like people of the river mm -hmm. and they feel that they, they are the, the rightful owners of the And I find it a very interesting point because I think that's what we often uh, find in also in the restitution debates that Europeans are very much inclined to look at European law, at European legal regulations, where the concept of ownership is typically based on 18th century enlightenment uh, literature. But in many other parts of the world, there are different thoughts about ownerships. And um, um, who are we to say, I don't say that you said it, but who are we to say that these people of the river are wrong? That's why I wanted to give the, the people from there, the locals, um, their voices. Also, this, this man, the, the old man, he's, he's highly appreciated in the community. So when I went out with him, also the farmers provided him with, with things they, they find in their, in their fields. And he has a very good knowledge. I mean, he obtained it by, by scrap, by, by, uh, yeah, by, by uh, learning, by doing. And um, he, he, he knows the sites. So we as archaeologists, we could also use uh, his knowledge on sites which are probably not discovered or not yet known by the archaeological department. So I sh have shown the archaeological department um, in Trovulan the, 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 the objects which I wanted to know the background and the sites and they didn't even know. So I think I mean, there's also a local knowledge of the people that they say it, it brings back luck. It, it gets, yeah, it's bad to to obtain something uh, and then not to give it back. So th there's also a local sort of heritage awareness, and this is important. But there are also these outsiders who, who, yeah, who who sell it off and um, not to take care of these local knowledge. So there's these uh, sort of yeah, local informations, and I think we, we should be more sensitive to, to their voices. Yeah, and I think it's always the, the issue, the local trade is not, it, it's legal anyway. So if they get it out of the river and sell it, that's fine. <laughs> uh, but once it's international, it gets illegal, yeah. isn't it, yeah, yeah. in a way? the fake ter terracotta pieces that are in many mu uh, museums as well they they say yeah but we we never said it was fake we it's 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 the yeah. intermediary market that makes it fake because they sell it for something old but they say we well, yeah we just did that already for a long time and we just do the same thing and suddenly it's fake because it's recently made they don't understand that yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and then there's also the narrative of um, the, the, those, the, the collectors who say, oh, we are saving the material, um, like um, yeah, others from, from the Ethnological Museum and the archives, they say, uh, yeah, we are saving the Borobudoa head, for instance, because the site is so deliberate. Uh, Lepitated, so we we save it that it is kept, and so it's it's another rhetorics that uh, again it's it's the dilemma. They are part of um, this evaluation of this heritage goods, but on the other hand, it's it's a commodity, as you said at the beginning. Mm -hmm. One last question, please. Uh, just uh, uh, following up, uh, also since you, uh, thank you for a great presentation and um, since you also take such a nuanced stance on, uh, um, well, these local perspectives and all the arguments made, isn't, I felt a bit uncomfortable that uh, in, in your presentation, you use very easily the word looters for that group, mm. whereas, um, uh, when we talk about uh, colonial collecting histories, it's very often about taking, and then later on it's said that it's 
so yeah, it's just a suggestion. I, I, I would uh, also because I mm. felt also a bit uncomfortable that I got to see the picture of a looter, uh, which um, yeah, um, yeah. So, but but yeah, apart from that, really great. You are very right, because this was the early stage of my paper and then afterwards I, I thought, oh, what term should I take? So, so I said maybe digging out or whatever, then it's, it's kind of more neutral. But I, I also, yes, I go with you that it's a critical point. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. I think we can end with this critical point uh, because I, uh, I think the terminology that we use uh, in identifying uh, different people involved in these <laughs> transactions <laughs> uh, is is something crucial, of course, as well. Yeah. So thanks a lot. We'll stop that here. <laughs> Now my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Brigitte Hauser-Schaublin, uh, who is Professor Emeritus at the Institute for Cultural and, uh, and Social Anthropology, Georg August University, Göttingen. Uh, and yeah, many of her recent publications focus on the ritual and, uh, and political organization of space on the one hand and on material culture, cultural heritage and cultural politics on the other. Uh, and she will present on transformations and relocations from uh, edicts to gods to antiquities, glimpses into the biography of uh, Balinese copper plate inscriptions. Thank you very much. And I also want to thank uh, the organizers of this symposium that they had the energy to wait three years until we finally meet <laughs> in person. Um, I talk about copper plate uh, inscriptions, though I'm not a linguist. I have actually not much understanding of uh, the inscriptions as such, but I will deal with them in a, a different context. So I will deal with the Sembiran inscriptions, um, which consist of 20 inscribed copper plates. They are about 30 centimeters long and 11 centimeters wide. Today, 10 of them are kept in the village of uh, Julach and 10 in its sibling village, Sembiran, both located in Bulelen district of Bali. They are considered as sacred, sacred heirlooms by the local people and they are looked after by priests and senior male leaders of the village association. They are the focus of rituals held in the most sacred part of the temples. They are ritually based, bathed and anointed and venerated by the villagers. It was Liefring, the Dutch controller of Bali between 1874 and 1878, who discovered 20 copper plates in Zembiran in the 1870s. It took Liefring a whole year to convince the villagers to lend him the copper plates in order to produce copies by, um, he made rubbings by using Chinese paper, a procedure which apparently was quite uh, difficult since some of the plates <coughs> were bent. Liefring uh, reported that the priest, the monk Gede of Sembiran's village, village temple was in charge of these heirlooms. The priest referred to them as pratime, as movable married, married material sites embodying deities. Nobody in the village was able to read the inscriptions. These sacred things were and still are considered as inalienable possessions, and even the high priest did not dare to keep them in his house or in the village. Instead, the copper plates were kept outside in a densely forested ravine. They were wrapped in a white cloth and hidden in a crevice of a rock. Um, once a year, on the occasion of the major festival of the village temple, they were ritually taken out and escorted by bearers with ceremonial lances to the temple, where they were venerated. The pratima remained in the temple during the festival, and the members of the village association presented offerings to them. When the festival ended at midnight, as Liefringer noted, they were escorted back to the hidden site outside of the village. 
Thus, for the inhabitants of Sembiran, these things have the status of deified persons Idebetare and are endowed with a supernatural agency. This applies to Tula as well. <clears throat> the Dutch scholar Jan Laurens Andreas Brandes transcribed the inscriptions and published them in Latin characters in 1890. It was Rudolf Horis who attempted the first translation. The archaeologist Ivan Artike and the linguist Ruciati Berata analyzed and retranslated the inscriptions in the 1990s. These translations are published in the book Burial Texts and Rituals, 2008. The copper plate prasastis are written in Old Javanese and Old Balinese language with many Sanskrit words. They contain edicts that were issued by different kings between Saka 844 and Saka 1, uh, 1103. The sites of these rulers have not been determined so far, though they most likely lived up near the Batur mountains. Thus, the original status of these copper plates was that they were once legal documents that were regularly publicly read on certain occasions. Brandes was surprised when he realized that the royal edicts were addressed not to Sembiran, where he had found them, but to Cholach, although they were all kept in Sembiran at that time. However, when Choris and Pugel visited the villages in 1965, they noted that the copper plates had been divided between Julach and Sembiran, each village holding 10 plates. No one seems to remember when or how this division took place. It must have occurred sometime between 1880 and 1960, probably around 1900. As the inscriptions reveal, Chula was a fortified harbor town, Kuta, an important and prosperous post of entry for merchants with goods from India, China, and beyond. The foreign merchants had, as the inscriptions state, their own district settlement nearby, and the, habit, the inhabitants of Chula were responsible for their safety. The kings obviously had an economic interest in Chula as a major site of import and export. They therefore tried to keep control over Chula as the edict document. A village of the same name still exists and archaeological excavations document that this site had been a port with transmaritime relations already more than 2000 years ago. Oral traditions confirmed the old site of the village and Chula's significance as a major port with an international marketplace during the 10th and 11th century. This stemmed from the fact that North Bali was touched by the trading route to the Spice Islands Moreover, the angering conditions were favorable and an abundant fresh water well was close to the shore. According to the seasonally shifting trading winds, ships from or to India and China anchored at Chulach, where the merchants and the ship crews were also awaiting for favorable trading winds. Due to its wealth and location near the shore, the village was repeatedly attacked by the intruders called Bunin from the sea, plundered and many of the inhabitants were killed. The edicts are reactions to complaints of the villagers to the king. The villagers had suffered the attack and were nevertheless obliged to pay taxes. The kings alleviated the burden and confirmed the villagers' uh, rights and duties. Chula began to gradually lose its importance as a harbor town, probably in the 13th century, when the trading route changed to the south of the island. The former kingdoms in the mountains disintegrated and Chula became a village of peasants and fishermen. The edicts then lost their validity. The knowledge of writing and reading got lost. It was then when a sacralization of the formal legal documents started. It is the status of sacred heirlooms the copper plates reached and still continues to the present. Even when Chula was no longer an important part, the village was still repeatedly raided in the centuries immediately 
uh, preceding Dutch colonial rule. The survivors always fled to a place up in the mountains called Upit, and the name already appears in the inscriptions. The last time when the inhabitants of Chula, who had fled to Upit, returned to the coastal area was probably in the early 19th century, um, at the time when already the influence from outside, such as the Dutch, was increasing. While living in Upit, the villagers had given their share of the copper plates for safety, safe custody to their sibling village, Sembiran. Only some time after Chula had resettled in the coastal site, did the two villages divide the plates again. In the second half of the 20th century, the villagers became aware that the sacred, sacred heirlooms were objects of desire for outsiders. The inalienability of the Pratima existed only from the villagers' perspective. For outsiders, art collectors and their suppliers, Prasasti were commodities, the price of which was even higher if they were antique and originated from an authentic cultural uh, context. In August 2002, Ivan Trang, the village head of Chula at that time, called us in Germany. He informed us that the Prasasti had disappeared, leaving the villagers in confusion and anger. What followed was a desperate search for the thief and the stolen heirlooms by traditional, that means spiritual means, and those of the modern state, that is police. On the one hand, Brian and the priest turned to the police and asked for tracker dogs. However, the smell of the perpetrator could no longer be identified by the dogs. On the other hand, Brian consulted a number of paranormal, male as well as female, Hindu Balinese as well as Muslim. None of their predictions became true. Two months later, Vian heard that the police of Kintamani sub-district had captured a thief. He had been accused of breaking into several temples. Vian and his team managed to get the name of a 64-year-old man from one of Tula's neighboring villages who was remanded in custody in, in Bangli. They were allowed to meet and question him. He finally admitted to having broken into the temple and also to having taken off with a small wooden box, assuming that some precious antiquities were in it. I have to add um, that, of course, he, he not uh, freely admitted where he, uh, that he had broken in. Uh, so he was heavily beaten up by the police uh, in the station several times. Um, not far from Jula, the prisoner explained he opened the box and realized that there were tent sheets of iron in it, each covered with Balinese characters. He also admitted that these goods were no longer in Bali, but had been transported to the house of a man in an East Javanese village. The group decided to immediately leave for Java in company of four policemen from Buleleng, Bali. Together with four local Javanese policemen from Bondovoso village, they arrived at the house of the man the thief had named at one o'clock in the night. The local police had warned the team of heightened tensions in the area. When they approached the house, the policemen had their weapons ready for firing. They were threatened by a crowd of villagers, men and women, all armed with sickles. When the police rushed into the building, they could not find the Prasasti, but fortunately met the man whom the thief had named. However, this man did not know the whereabouts of the stolen goods. Bayan, still afraid that the valuables were somewhere close by and could therefore be handed over to a middleman for sale, urged one of the policemen from Techakula Bali to call the police in Bangli and ask them to bring the thief to the phone so that his accomplice could talk to him and inquire where he had hidden them. This finally happened and the thief revealed that he had hidden the antiquities in a cow, a cow barn. When the policeman and Wayan entered the barn, Wayan saw a bundle wrapped in white cloth and covered with plastic above the head of a calf. He collapsed and began sobbing. He realized that he was encountering Ida Petare, though located in an inappropriate place. 
Next morning, the group returned to Singaraja. You see, um, I think it's Vayan carrying the bundle with the um, copper plates on his shoulder. It's the way uh, sacred things are carried by men. So they returned to Bali. At the Sea Temple of Bonjok Patu, they were met by village deputies and um, they together they formed a procession and could continue their way home by foot. They when they arrived, the most senior ritual leader took over the sacred goods while other ritual elders had brought offerings to welcome the deities. In the afternoon, the Ida Betara were escorted directly to the shrine. There, the senior ritual leaders, the policemen from Chejakula and hundreds of villagers had already assembled. The Adat official, Jero Penyarikan, asked one of the policemen about, about how the stolen goods had been recovered. While this uniformed policeman was recounting the whole story, he fell into trance and had to be revived with sanctified water. This trance was taken as an indication that the goods, that, that the gods acknowledged the reunification with the material manifestation of Idebetare and were present in the temple again. Only when the policeman had recovered consciousness did Jero Penyarikan distribute sanctified water to the community. The transformation of antiquities back into Pratima was completed. Some weeks and even months later, the ritual leaders of Chula had to bring the Pratima to the police offices, since the police wanted to confront the thief's accomplice from uh, Java and also later the thief with the corpus delicti. So the, for the police, it was a corpus delicti. When the delegation from Chula arrived in Bangri, they were allowed to see the thief, but not more. In fact, the villagers had asked the policemen to let them punish him by their own way, and that means lynching. However, the police refused this request. He was sentenced for burglary and was transferred to jail in Singaraja. In 2004, thanks to Vayan Trang, who still was village head at that time, I was able to visit this man in jail and to talk to him and learn about his life. He had been Klian Adat, the official in charge of rituals in one of Tula's neighboring villages for several years. He was a notorious gambler who had to sell everything, even the land he had inherited, in order to pay his gambling debts. Moreover, he lost everything, also his family and his faith in Hindu Balinese religion. He eventually married a Javanese woman and converted to Islam. As a former expert in Adat matters, he knew about the valuables kept in neighboring village temples. The man in the middle, that's clear, I think. <laughs> and right is Vayan. He broke into many temples and stole sculptures, golden, golden ornaments, carved statues, crees, and whatever he could get. During the interview, the thief never used the term pretima or prasasti, but spoke of antique goods. To my knowledge, none of the villages was ever able to retrieve its sacred goods. The major reason for this is that people had never closely examined these sacred idebetare. Therefore, they were not able to give a detailed description of them. In Zambiran, a whole bundle of crease was stolen. When the priests reported this theft to the police, they were asked to give a description of them. However, even the high priest had never dared to open the bundle. They could not even say how many crease, how many crease had, had been in it. In September 2010, I called Vayan Trang and inquired about the whereabouts of the thief. He told me that he had died about two years ago. Shortly after he had been released from prison, he once more broke into a temple. He was caught by the police and shot dead during the skirmish. Uh, so my conclusion, a couple plate um, inscription, uh, inscriptions have undergone 
several transformation and translocations from royal edicts issued and produced at a meeting on a market day near the king's palace transported to Julach. They became, in a second step, sacred heirlooms and de deified beings. And finally, in the mail stream of the international uh, art market or antiquity market, they became potential commodities, especially on the international black art market with its whitewashing procedures. However, it was through the colonial encounter the Pratima have also become objects of knowledge to scholars and subsequently also objects of knowledge, academic knowledge of, to local people. They are unique historical documents, while at the same time for the people of Sembiran and Chula, they are sacred heirlooms. When we talk about restitution, we also assume the notion of ownership, and that would be the topic of a whole conference, it would need it. The example shows that knowledge related to the object and the material thing are two entities, and there may be more than just one knowledge, namely an object as source of academic knowledge and the knowledge um, about the sacred place of a deity. Um, we have to note that the rubbings leafing made contain the source of academic knowledge. The originals are no longer needed for deciphering the text and distributing the knowledge. And the distribution of academic knowledge is very important today, open access. By contrast, sacred heirlooms and the knowledge about them are bound to their materiality, the object and its spirituality. As sacred beings, they need an appropriate site where they could or should be kept. They are not circulated, bar, but enclaved, to use one of Apadurai's term. And this is taking out of the flow of commodities. So, thank you. Thanks a lot for that fascinating story <laughs> of, an, uh, of an object transformed many ways and retraced, uh, stunningly enough. Yeah. Uh, questions, please. Please, Mark. Thank you. Uh, it's a fascinating story. Um, I was hesitating if I still should ask uh, the question I'm going to ask because it seemed that you answered it in the conclusion. But I was uh, intrigued that in the way you build up the PowerPoint, you start with sacred knowledge and then there is secular knowledge. And then the whole story comes, uh, the whole story evolves and you see that all sorts of, all forms of knowledge come together at a place. But I was wondering, it's main, it's not in the way you told it, but in the way uh, of the PowerPoint, if you are, are not making um, too strict uh, separation between what is academic knowledge as something good to be disseminated and sacred knowledge, whereas I would say there is exchange going on and the one empowers or, or legitimizes the other further, even further. So that, yeah, um, that's more, I think, a comment. And, uh, but well, maybe, uh, what do you think? <laughs> you mean about the distribution of academic knowledge? I, I mean, that, that's, I think that your example actually shows that the, the separation between what we think is academic knowledge or uh, and local knowledge as something traditional and spiritual and sacred that your story actually shows that it is muddled at both sides they are two sides of the material objects and they are on, on the same level of course so i wouldn't say that local would... knowledge is, is below the academic are you aiming at that no, I, I was aiming at that they are influencing each other. Of course. Thank you. Ashley, please. Yeah, I just to uh, wait, wait for the microphone, please. Yeah, thank you very much for, for a fascinating talk. And I, I just wanted to follow up on, on your, your exchange just now. Um, 
You also ended on so that the separation or now relation between those two types of knowledge, but also on materiality or embodiment, I think maybe you didn't use that word, but materiality on the side of the of the local knowledges. Um, I wonder if there's a way of thinking that question uh, of the relation between the two that would also go through the question of materiality insofar as um, one might with with your particular objects you might say okay the academic knowledge is derived from the writing and so that is as you said open ac access accessible etc um if we consider it to be a pratima right um then we the the embodiment or the materiality is perhaps inseparable from the academic knowledge as well so i'm just wondering about that division um and how you might how you think about that um i mean it's inseparable uh, for the local people, of course, um, but we uh, should think of the importance history today has for local people. So this is a very poor, or both villages are very poor villages, um, but the knowledge now to have the confirmation that they have in fact a very long history has contributed to their identity and to their pride. Um, and of course, this kind of knowledge is embodied in the material materiality of, of the copper plates as well. But um, when I show slides of the characters, the Balinese characters, um, it doesn't matter where the material objects are. I wanted to emphasize that, that academic research makes a kind of abstraction from the object as such, while for local people, it's, it cannot be separated. But it's fascinating that it fed back <laughs> and essentially reinforced the importance of the object. Yes, of course. Yeah. And you can imagine what would have happened if the police had uh, recovered these objects. They would have followed the the state the, the track of the state and probably finally um, ended up in a museum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, please. Thank you for that uh, very, very interesting talk. I, I just, I'm just so shocked <laughs> by the contrast between your presentation and the one by Mai Lin, where, and, and it's both, both very good, really good field, field research following, following the police in this case. Um, but but the, the, the shocking aspect is the difference between something you know, presumably, if, if those copper plates had been found in the Musi River, you know, and had come onto the international art market through that through that way, then you had it, it would be treated in exactly the same way as something stolen from from a village in Bali, where it was treated as a sacred object, and and that that kind of highlights just um, how problematic it it is for when museums acquire something from the international art market with no idea of where it's coming from, because it could be either of those scenarios. Of course, I have shown one picture with a crown on it. It's a golden crown. It was originally a gift set um, given by the king as a kind of document, uh, legitimation. Uh, and this is already the third copy and um, it's not a copy in a Western sense, but it's a uh, it's a crown made according to the um, to the standard of the time. So I first thought might might this be the original shape, but it, of course it's not. But um, these crowns, twice stolen, um, must have turned up in the international market. Nobody knows where they come from, and uh, this also is a dimension. Um, uh, repatriation. I want to do you want to repatriate objects without provenance and one of the major whitewashing um, techniques of this black market and partly the legal market as well is or has been to blur where they come from. Yeah. yeah, thanks a lot. I think we have to end here very, very interesting uh, session that leaves us with many 
questions to think about. Uh, we have uh, half an hour uh, tea break and, and so we reconvene here at, at four. Thanks to all the speakers.